the undone is the blonde. I my I'm an advocate. My official title is director of appeals and eligibility. I focus on mostly the um, appeals and eligibility part that connect there. Kristen, who's actually on, focuses on a DME PAT type of appeal. We're going to talk more in general at this point. So the one thing we cannot, and I cannot stress enough is, you have to open your mail. You have to open it right away. I'm on Medicaid. I get the stress of knowing when you get that envelope that it may be bad news or what appears to be bad news, but there are timelines involved if you need to file an appeal or file an appeal and ask questions later. That's really important. I know people stress about it for a couple of weeks. They finally open their mail. And sometimes you've missed important deadlines. And one of the most important deadlines is that deadline that lets you continue benefits during the time of the appeal. And what that means is your benefits won't be cut off while everything gets sorted out. Or if it's an appeal where um, they're reducing services, you'll be able to keep those services as you work through the appeal. If you miss those deadlines, we cannot go back and fix them. Appeal trials, why this is important, is even though you continue benefits or not, trials are not set out for many, many months. So if you miss that deadline, you are not going to be able to continue benefits sometimes for up to four or five months. So it's really important to open your mail. The second important thing is if you have a question, you need to ask those questions promptly. We at CCDC, from our experience, are always going to say, and what we do personally, is you file the appeal first, talk later. The reason is anybody in the system can give you lip service, and that does not mean that anything they have done or will say they're going to do will ever protect your rights especially those to continue benefits. Angela, when you get a sec, could you pull up, put up the appeal form? Coming at you. Thank you. <laughs> so when you file an appeal, I see so many times people want to write this whole scenario and story out. You don't need to do that. The, there are very few things that need to be um, included when an appeal is filed. Your name, your address, you don't have to give an email or a phone if you're represented. You can give it. Um, you need your date of birth and you need either your case number on your notice, which we'll go over next, but we're doing this first for a reason. And then your Health First Medicaid number, just your simple Medicaid number. You need to say what happened. So in most cases, the majority of cases 
our eligibility from data. So in uh, eligibility, whether you use a form or not, you put your name, your address, your date of birth, your Medicaid, and who sent you the letter. If it's a Medicaid letter, which is what we do as Medicaid, you're gonna either put Medicaid Health First Colorado or mark the little box. What happened? You were terminated, the application was denied. We don't do generally recovery um, overpayment because we don't do food stamps. Other, if there is an other, for example, if you applied for Medicaid buy-in and they go, hey, we need your assets or you're not eligible because you did not meet disability level, um, you can make notes in here. The next section is, um, section D is who the action is against. Generally, it is against a county department of human service. Generally, it is. There are times where um, Medicaid, more in long-term care or other kinds of appeals, Medicaid would be listed, but generally it's going to be your county department of human services. You list your county, you can't, you are the appellee, the appellant, you can sign it, not sign it. Um, they don't really care. Your signature is going to be on something. It's really important though to put the date. The administrative court is not always as prompt as we'd like. And whether you're doing this as an advocate or as a person, sometimes three weeks go by and you don't hear back from them about your case from the court and you call them, they're gonna go, what date did you send it in? Because their tracking system goes by date. And so putting the date is really important. That's all you need to do to file. If you do on what would be the right side, the representative, if, there, if you want someone to rep you, you need to ask them first. And then whether you submit the form or not, um, you're going to, if I took a case over or Kristen did, we'd fill that information out and we'd notify it. Many times people fill that part out on the forms or put it in their little written notice to the court. We cannot accept a case unless we know it's a valid case and we're aware of it. So on every notice, there's a date, like this one says January 3rd, case number is on the appeal form, it's also what you need to be able to be tracked. So those are important um, information. When you see something near the end of the month, panic and get a hold of an advocate and try to file the appeal yourself first something near the end of the month is always going to trigger timelines and continuing benefits. 
Now, what I try to stress to people, you've opened your mail promptly and you save your envelope or your peak date that you got it because on the envelope, the postmark date is something that we can continue rights on and continue your benefits on. So let's say the notice says January 30th and the benefits were going to be cut off, but I can prove either through peak or a postmark that I was not given 10 days notice. I can use that as a justification to continue benefits. So some stuff comes from the county, but you'll notice uh, on the top here, it says Colorado Medical Assistance Program. What that says is to me, and hopefully you all will learn, that that is a Medicaid buy-in situation. Colorado Medical Assistance Program only gets involved if it's Medicaid buy-in. However, when you file the appeal, you still file it against the county. So don't let who it came from put you off on a tangent. It's always going to be the county in most eligibility. So this notice is a good notice. It gives everything and it tells you what you're qualified for. But this is also a trick. So it says, Donna, me, qualifies for Health First Colorado Medicaid buy-in program as of March 20. 20, you also qualify for long-term care supports and services. Now, this is where what Kristen and I do cross into the specialty areas we work on appeals for. Every Medicaid buy-in notice will tell you that, but you will be denied the services, because the notice does not tell you, you still have to go through the single entry point to start your long-term care benefits and get your forms done. So there are some tricks in the notices, which is why whenever you have a notice that is funny, file an appeal first, ask questions later. Don't go to somebody and start asking questions, and especially by phone, because somebody at that basic county level does not know what any of that means, and you could run your timelines out. CCDC tries to address things with HICPUP all the time, but there are gaps in noticing that need to be dealt with. Now, then it'll say, if you're on buy-in, you may have a monthly premium. Buy-in calculation of income it is similar to MAGI or a dual eligibility. The only difference with buy-in, and we've seen much more of these, which is why we're going to focus on this a little bit, is that your income on your premium is calculated in multiple ways. Many people on buy-in don't actually pay a premium. So the premium you may have to pay is going to be person-specific on whether your income is earned income or unearned income. You get your notice, you've looked at it or it's panicked you, and 
you're not sure, let's say you have a couple of days, you opened your mail right away, you have a couple of days, the supporting law section, and you have to look at it on every notice you get. It could be on the DME notice, durable medical power of equipment. It could be on a um, long-term care if you're on SLS or CDOS. The supporting law tells you whether the actual notice is what they're signing. And sometimes that's really important because they may cite something in the supporting law that has nothing to do with what the notice is about. And it tricks people. So we as advocates will look up the supporting law and the volumes, it's easy, you can search it. Um, online, it'll pop up in the Secretary of State's office. But as advocates, that's what we look at to see if there is an issue with um, a notice that we can fix promptly once the appeal is filed. Again, do not talk to your case manager, your county worker, before you file an appeal. If you have an advocate, like you can let us know, we can guide you through it. File the appeal before you talk to people. Talk is cheap. It's not going to mean a difference if you talk to somebody and you lost your benefits. It's really important to file first, talk later. So January 30th, they say she is me is not eligible for benefits. Now, right here is a key to tell advocates and you as a recipient or family member who made this notice. And what I mean by that is on decision made on January 28th, on January 28, 2020, at 9.32 p.m., that means a human being did not issue that notice. That notice was issued by the state Medicaid computer. It does that. It's not always a bad thing it does that. What I see with what um, I do, it also sometimes is sending out periodic warnings that if you're not terrified to open your mail, it sends out clues that something is wrong and something is going to need to be done because the county, in most cases, has not met a timeline or is very close to violating it. So that gives me as an advocate a clue. That also gives the administrative court and HICPAF eligibility a clue as to what is going on and where the errors happened or going to happen and why. So this says, Health First Colorado Medicaid and Long-Term Supports and Service. As of February 29th, you don't qualify because you didn't meet the level of care requirements. Sometimes it'll say income requirements. Again, I am going to, and you, for your family member, your clients, file the appeal. What happens in most of these cases is somebody at the county did not run the program to um, run the eligibility in the appropriate time frame. So counties have 45 days to run an app, initial app, or redetermination 
or a long-term care DSS-1. It's just a form that has to be issued. I know doing this every day, I'm still not going to wait. I filed the appeal on that. Talk later. Hey, the appeal's filed. When are you going to get it run? If I did not file the appeal, then I would not have continuing benefits, even if the county took six months to run the appeal, to run the app and the financials to match up, or the administrative courts were booking trials right now into September. I would be without services that whole time. Do I like opening my mail from Medicaid? No. Do I have to? Yes. And do I have to promptly? So Medicaid is not discriminatory. It is messed up for everybody. And everybody can protect their rights. As scary as it seems to file first, and some counties will get nasty. And as Kristen and I know, some single entry points get nasty or um, different organizations we may have to work with. And they'll try to guilt you as the client and go, hey, remove, withdraw the appeal, we'll fix it. No, you don't. You never remove it anything until it's settled and you have proof. Um, uh, there was a question popped up. We can... The client doesn't qualify for long-term care on the form, but they were functionally approved to appeal here. So, okay, each long-term care case has two parts. It has a functional and a financial. In long-term care eligibility, um, the financials are determined two different ways, depending on whether you're applying with Medicaid buy-in or not. Without Medicaid buy-in, the financials include assets. So they are going to ask you for everything your name is on. If you forget to give them something, there is this asset verification system that will find anything you're attached to, a bank account you may not have closed, a vehicle you sold that someone else didn't register going back to 1971 is the furthest back I've seen it. Now, if you're on Medicaid buy-in and you're, whether you're a child or an adult, child assets count somewhat through your parents and your parents' income but if you're an adult, straight adult, assets don't count. So for example, when I or my clients get a notice that says, we want your bank account, send your car vehicle, I go, you ain't getting it. You're not entitled to it. So two components, functional, financial. Brenda, did that answer your question? So there, I guess I also meant that they are, hold on, I'm trying to read it here. Financially approved and they get a letter. Sorry, and let me read it. It says, uh, I guess I also meant that they are financially approved and functionally approved and they get a letter that says they don't qualify. We get this all, all the time. I just assumed it was a glitch in the system. He filed the appeal every time because it could be a glitch. And sometimes that time on that notice will 
give you the clue whether it was a human or a computer. Honestly, I file my appeals and for coworkers and regular clients, there are times I'm filing an appeal every single month on a notice. The reason that's important, it takes uh, five minutes to file an appeal, but the reason it's important is that CCDC also works with HICPUF on fixing errors, making notices clear. Is there a problem with the computer system? Um, did, for example, like Angela said earlier, no one's supposed to be kicked off Medicaid. I got another one today for an uh, individual who's kicked off. Don't assume it's an error. File, the appeal can be withdrawn. Always file. I have many questions. Okay, <laughs> so there, and we don't have, um, those kind of notices here, but they're also the same pattern. So let's say um, the individual is functionally and long-term care eligible. However, they get their letter that says that um, they're eligible for one hour of services. That would be a long-term care kind of appeal. It could be a home health type of appeal, meaning an agency. It could be IHSS, higher level nursing needs, or it could be CDOS. Again, it's always the same type of appeal. File the appeal, ask questions later. The only thing we don't do, um, we do pediatric assessment tools, uh, appeals. Kristen does those. She's like way good at it. One of the best, I'd say. <laughs> um, we're not doing um, CDOS allotments or I IHSS allotments right now because the eligibility is so high and that is where we are actually seeing the volume of problems is in the eligibility area not as much in the other areas right now all those things have trends did you mention the time you have i mean i know you keep saying appeal immediately but there's um what is it's, the time frame? On eligibility, it's 10 days after the notice or when, like, this notice says that I would have been kicked off the end on March 1st. Okay. Before that date, before the day. And that's the trick. That's why we say open them, save your envelope open your peak accounts because each different thing has a different timeline. Ah, so I was speaking from my expertise and it doesn't transfer. No, that's the prop. That's why you're an expert, but explain yours. Cause that what you do has a 10 day timeline. Well, it's like, um, if you are a parent, CNA for your child. Um, the agency that is providing you services has to submit what is called a pediatric assessment tool. And you only get paid for care that is considered skilled. And there's a definition of that in state law. And what happens is your agency submits the form and Medicaid says, eh, that's not skilled, it's all personal care, deny all skilled care. Okay, well, if they're gonna deny skilled care, you have no income. And if you have no income and you don't have another source of income, you really have no income. 
So you're going to appeal that and you have to look at the letter very carefully and look at the date by which they say, you have to respond by this date or the benefits will cease. Okay, you know, I'm gonna, can I jump in and ask though? Because we have like three different dates on here. You have January 30th, January 28th, and February 29th. And that's not the other date that if you read further down is the 60 day timeline. Yep, you have 60 days just to, that's, that's the longest period of time right. you have to then, file an appeal, but if you don't file it soon enough, you, you won't lost your benefits. Right. right, so that's the problems with the notice. So open your notice, file the appeal. Do not worry about um, some of the dates. Just get the appeal filed. Save your envelope. Now, there's a, a question. Yes, this is very confusing, Erica. <laughs> Absolutely, totally. Um, if you need an advocate, CCDC is one of the few places that not only will help you file an appeal, but we will, Kristen and I have to review a case first thoroughly and determine if we would represent during the appeal. CCDC is one of the only organizations that consistently does this, but we do have a strict criteria. Um, Donna, we do have a, uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I was gonna say, we do have a number of questions and I wanted to go. Wow, we have. Yeah, or in yeah. order here. Um, anyway, when, I think when, when you need to know, because I've got a client who's, who's, tw who's anxious about this. Um, I live in Pueblo. So I represent my clients before the judge by phone. And so my client does not see me. The judge does not see me. I am a voice coming out of a device. That can be a little off-putting. However, especially now, that's how everything is done. And it works. <laughs> so, um, Right, we're not, we are rarely ever going to do anything face-to-face. -face. We can set up Zoom, we can do things by phone. Kristen and I handle appeals for the entire state. So we can't be in multiple places plus our disabilities. We do a lot by email, even the administrative court, it's all by phone. And that's weird for people to understand, but um, it's the way we can help the most people the most. But if we find you're flaky and you don't get back to us and give us documents we ask for or explain or respond, we have to withdraw from an appeal. So. We do a lot. We're one of the rare ones that do it, but we have kind of strict boundaries. What questions next, Angela? Okay, uh, first let me say to Hillary um, the, and to everyone, the recording with the captions will be posted probably sometime next week on our website, so you actually can watch it again and again. Um, and if you have questions, you can always send them to us, so. Um, this okay, is, this is Mo stuff. Yeah. Uh, Mozak says, my 19 year old son is on Medicaid. However, his payment is reduced because they won't consider him a household of one. Um, I'm gonna unmute you, there you go. So you can add your question. Uh, is there anything I can do so he gets the full amount? That would be social security that we don't touch. Oh, that's, that's not, not Medicaid. Okay. Did you want to add to that at all? I don't know who Mozak is, so I'm just going to use Mozak. <laughs> nope, he muted himself. Okay, Lisa says, does the appeal form come with the notice letter? No, it does not. 
we're posting, we're going to give you the appeal form as a template. It Because we have found over the years, and actually that's what I personally use, um, it just gives you a quicker outline. So you don't need to write a whole story. Like I got kicked off benefits and I turned my paperwork in and don't do that. Just get the appeal filed. We are going to give you that form. Basically, all you need to say is, I don't agree with the decision to change my benefits, period. Right. Even, Just, if, you write it, even if you write it by hand, that's all you need to say. Um, I disagree with the decision. It says in C, I request a state level hearing before an administrative law judge. I am appealing the following adverse action, and that's all you need. There was an adverse action, you're filing an appeal. I may not know what each of these boxes mean. I don't know how many people know what a prior authorization denial is, um, or a Health First Colorado Medicaid, what does that mean? That's why you, we just say, if, if, you're, if your benefits are being changed, you have to let them know you disagree with it, period. Can you just put that in other, click other, and say, I disagree with this? Well, normally what people do and is you're going to put what you got in it. So even if you never mark a box and you scribble, I don't agree with the denial, my Medicaid number or health first name, address, um, the court is smart. They are going to figure out what category it goes in. They really do. You, what the level Kristen and I file appeals, we are filing as non-attorneys with the same rights to act as an attorney. So we're going to give more detail. You don't have to. You can make mistakes. And people will make mistakes. That's okay. Kelsey says, for people applying for Medicaid buy-in or doing a Medicaid buy-in redetermination, should they just not fill out info about assets, people in household, etc.? I know it doesn't count for buy-in recipients, but are we required to report that info anyway? Are we allowed to not report it? So, okay. Kelsey, when you're doing the um, redetermination, what I do and suggest clients to do, right, I'm applying for Medicaid. You are not getting it. Simple. You're not entitled to it. You are not getting it. They are not entitled to it, and you do not have to give anything but your earned and unearned income. That's what your premium and eligibility is based on. Donna, you said you're applying for Medicaid. I think you meant Medicaid buy-in? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just checking. Thanks, Donna. Yeah, I find it interesting that the redetermination paperwork, it seems like it's the same as for typical Medicaid. So it asks to attach all of your bank statements, talk about assets, household size, even though it doesn't matter. Um, so it's interesting that it they don't have just a different form, more specific to buy in. They did. And then, when, then they went back. Um, to asking for it, there is new forms going to be coming out probably the beginning of the year. Yeah, just write on it, Medicaid buy-in, you're not entitled or I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> they can't penalize you for it and be clear, Medicaid buy-in. Thanks, Donna. Oh, right <laughs> Thanks for helping me get set up with my Medicaid buy-in last year when I yeah, had my very, issues. You're <laughs> very welcome. It is, it is very confusing paperwork. And what is the full uh, official name of that program? Medicaid buy-in? No, it's Medicaid 
Oh, for well, it depends. Either you're a working adult with disabilities or you're a child with disabilities. Yes. It's something like a buy in for adults who are working or something. It's this big long thing. I think it's Medicaid buy in for working, for working adults, adults, adults with disabilities. Yeah, WADA. Yes, because I've got a fellow who, um, even though he is dying of cancer, he is still working. And he's the kind of person that will be working until the day he drops. And he is now getting Medicaid through the buy-in. It took me a long time to figure out that that's what he was talking about. He wasn't otherwise qualified for Medicaid at all. He had but, way too much. Well, and Kristen, did you see like the notice? It says buy-in, but some notices will say water. Oh, no, it's it's this guy, you know, it's all alphabet soup in his head. Yeah, you know? it is. And when he applied, it was from the hospital, and they have an adult Medicaid program. And it's just called that, adult Medicaid. Oh. So when he's trying to explain to me that he doesn't think he's in the system, and he's using all of these words interchangeably. It's hard for me to figure out what he's talking about. And I have to accept that if he knows nothing about Medicaid and disability benefits, absolutely nothing. And none of this makes sense to him. All that he knows is that he has to have Medicaid. There is no way in the end of time that he can possibly pay for his medical needs. Right. And so I have to be really careful because there are a number of different things that might apply in his situation. And I don't want to be giving him bad information. That's just a caveat. Because now we all know it as buy in and that's all we're saying. But it actually has a longer name. Well, if you look the notice, then that's why I use that notice, um, it says buy-in. It doesn't say WADA. It does. If, he, he didn't get a notice either. One oh, of his providers just told him that he wasn't in the system. Oh, it's correct. Yeah, did, don't believe anybody. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and then he was complaining because he said he went back to the office where they were helping him and they wouldn't pay attention to him. And I have no idea what he said to them. I can only imagine. <laughs> right. No, and that's some of why they stopped um, using WADA in when we're talking or, you know, we're talking to HICPA for uh, SEP, we'll use WADA because that's mm -hmm. how it comes up on the med spans. But that's why they switched to buy-in because it was confusing the heck out everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just warning people of that. Yeah. Why did I have to make it so difficult? Wait, that's not a good question. Okay. It's Medicaid. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about Medicaid. The only thing, um, there and are then, things that are more, more, Social Security is more complicated. <laughs> yes. I'll just say it that way. I agree. Let's go to Hillary. You want to unmute yourself? Hi. Um, so last month, or actually in a, toward the end of March, I uh, applied for SNAP benefits. Whoops. I, I didn't expect that uh, it would it would get approved, but I thought I would give it a try. I do it periodically, um, and hadn't for a long time. Um, I got denied. But then I immediately got um, another notice. I got another, I got a notice for a uh, redetermination, um, but it was for my daughter who is on a waiver, uh, on the CES waiver and she's determined we do it, you know, once a year, it, it starts over her plan year starts over 9-1, so, you know, I mean, she shouldn't be being all of a sudden redetermined, right, for Medicaid. Sounds and, like a computer glitch. Right. 
I agree. And I agree. And I contacted her caseworker, her CES caseworker through Rocky Mountain, um, to alert her to this. And she sent me a copy of basically the eligibility document that she has um, if I needed it and told me on her end everything looks fine, you know, to, I, she didn't think I needed to worry um, because this was all through PEAK, um, the PEAK system, right? And uh, <laughs> oh, don't trust PEAK. Well, right. And, well, I got the letter and they're like, you know, go in to PEAK and la la la. And um, so I tried to do it through the online system, but it it didn't it didn't jive. Like the stuff that I was allowed to update uh, wasn't what I needed to update. It just it didn't it wasn't gonna work. Um, and I tried to call like over and over and over and couldn't get through. Got to the point where it just hung up on me. It's like you know, forget it, lady. <laughs> call another time so I kind of hit a roadblock and I at my question then for you all is do you think that is just a do I just ignore it at this point um or do I keep trying to get through to the county no you file in the appeal okay because I mean, didn't say she was being dropped it just said a, it was a redetermination Okay, so what you say is, uh, you filed the appeal and say I had questions about the redetermination. I have not been able to get in contact with anybody. Remember, right now we're in a different period of time where um, COVID rules have changed, but the day the feds release the COVID rules, everything is gonna go wonky. Protect yourself now. Okay. You can file appeals for anything that does not make sense. Okay. And um, I apologize, but I was a few minutes late logging on. So I didn't see where exactly do I find that. I saw the appeal form you were going through. It's right on there. The Is address, fax, phone the, number. No, I mean, it's where? On, it's on the... Um, are you familiar with the Office of Administrative Courts? A tiny bit. Okay, Office of Administrative Courts and then forms. That's one way to get it. Okay. Don, are you posting all the um, forms that you're talking about? Yeah, we're going to post them. I actually have them with the recording. It'll all be put together, sort of okay. as a package that you can access as well. Okay, awesome. All right. Great, thank you. You got it. Um, okay, Nikki has a question. I'm gonna go real quick there, though, first to Carrie. You said if someone's kicked off Medicaid, right. is it possible to reapply, yes or no? Okay, Carrie, let me ask you, yours. Uh, was this supposed to be a yes or no? <laughs> um, I have to get with Kara, because is that about yours? Yes. Okay. Um, we'll get together. That should have been fixed. Okay. Oh, okay. Do you we'll, want to email me? I'll email you, yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For those of us who don't know, if you get kicked off, can you reapply? Yes. Okay. But you're going, to, if you don't reapply correctly, you will have a gap in your coverage. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, Nikki. Oh, hi. Hey, girl. How are you? Um, I just had that one question about Medicaid buy-in, if that's all right. You want to just restate yeah. that? Medicaid. Okay. So you trick down. question, Nikki. Okay. The trick is, just like showed on uh, the other note is, once you roll in to buy in, you still, it's going to say you're automatically enrolled in long-term care. However, you then need to meet the same standard, the ULTC or the PIN form has to be done. You're still going to have to assess. Generally, most of it will roll over. 
Remember though, Colorado access will not be the single entry point in July 1st. So there are going to be glitches we are working through with HICFA. So you notify them you're working, you're still disabled, you can prove it. Um, they should roll it over. Yeah, and you know what's funky about mine was that, you know, they gave me a, and this is just my own personal experience, you know, but they gave me a notice in the mail um, saying that, you know, I was dropped from long-term care, but still had Medicaid buy-in. So that's why I'm working with CCDC right now to kind of figure that out, see what's going on. They're working on it. So <laughs> in this whole time period, as of February 18th, no one can be cut off any Medicaid benefits. However, it took them another month to get the computer, CBMS, to recognize that. Then you have county workers or single entry points who see dates showing up on the DSS-1 PARs and they're issuing notices. Yours, Nicole, is being looked at. Bye, Hiccup. I gotcha. <laughs> Donna is like seriously one of the best advocates. I mean, everybody at CCD is amazing, but I love uh, tapping Donna for her historical <laughs> knowledge too. I agree. Donna does everything. I only do a little part. <laughs> um, Angela, you all post my email address or yeah. Um, so if you have questions, we'll give you Kristen and my emails. Ask questions. There is no silly question. We have been doing this for more years than you can imagine. And still odd situations come up where we need to ask questions. I never stop learning this. Right. I never stop learning. And that's why I tuned in because I figured Donna was going to have something in here that I needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So okay. give me about a week. This will be posted. The recording with the, the captions, that's why it takes me a while, um, will be posted on our virtual events page. Follow the link for past events. And um, if there's something that you would like, you know, to hear more about, let us know and we'll see if we can't arrange for another one of these coming up, okay? Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>